on this fourth Sunday of Lent as we continue on our journey to look at the cross and allow God to show us his glory. None of us are foolish enough to think that we can fully behold and understand the goodness and salvation of God. And yet sometimes we are just satisfied with what we know and we stop seeking more. So I invite you to join with me, join your hearts with me as we hear just a few verses of scripture and seek the more that God has to show us on the cross. And this passage that we're looking at today is from uh, Colossians in the second chapter, beginning in verse 13. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. So church, what are you afraid of? What do you fear most in this life? What powers and authorities are controlling and limiting and binding you? What are you afraid of? We're learning in these weeks how to see the cross, and most of us have been taught to see it very narrowly, not wrongly, but narrowly. We learn to see that the cross is important, but it mainly speaks to us about our destiny in the life to come. We learn that the cross tells us that God will care for us in our deaths and raise us to eternal life. And the cross promises us that God will forgive us and not hold our sins against us. And these things are true. And they are worthy of celebration. If that was all there was, it would be more than enough. And there is more truth. There is more to see in the cross. The cross has so much more to give us. Yes, the cross promises us eternal life, a promise that God will fulfill later at the moment of our deaths. And the cross promises us life abundant here and now. In the cross, we receive a way of living with freedom and power and joy that is beyond our wildest expectations. See, in the American church, we've reduced and domesticated the whole gospel and specifically the cross. We've made it into a future-oriented, otherworldly promise. It's the key to the kingdom of God, but that's not here. Before the early church... And for marginalized, powerless believers across the generations, the cross wasn't only a source of life and hope and salvation for the world to come, but for the early church and for marginalized Christians throughout the centuries, the cross is the way and the truth and the life of transformation here and now. The cross is our entry into God's kingdom here in this place It's more than a promise for salvation after death. It's salvation here and now. So I ask you again, what are you afraid of? Because Paul says something really outrageous in the last verse that we read today. And it's easy to miss it because Paul does love to talk. And I know, pot, kettle, black. But Paul says in verse 15 something crazy. He says that Jesus... On the cross, as he is being crucified, what he's really doing is disarming the powers and authorities that condemned him. 
Paul says that on the cross, Jesus is making a public spectacle of them. That on the cross, Jesus is triumphing over them. And most of us, when we look at the cross, we might see what Paul says in verse 14. We might see our spiritual debt being nailed to the cross and destroyed, but what we don't see is the powers and authorities of this world being disarmed and publicly humiliated. We don't see the triumph of Jesus. Maybe we see it on Easter Sunday. Or if we really want to see the triumph of Jesus, we'll just turn all the way to that scary book in the back of the Bible, John's Revelation, and we'll see the vision of the heavenly throne room with the throng of people from every nation and tongue that we sang about as we opened worship, the casting down their crowns and worshiping and bowing before Jesus the Lamb. But on the cross... We don't see Jesus winning. Let's be honest. Mostly on the cross, we see Jesus losing, right? I mean, real talk. If being falsely arrested and condemned and tortured and shamed and stripped and being betrayed and abandoned by your people and being put to death in a slow public agony, if that is winning, I don't want to win. Sign me up for losing. We look at the cross, and we see that the winners are Pilate, and Herod, and Caesar, and the Sanhedrin, and the Pharisees, and Jesus Barabbas. He did pretty well. Basically, we see that the winners are anyone not hanging on a cross. We look at the cross and see the winners in that particular moment are the people with the power to kill their enemies. We see a lot of truth on the cross. But we haven't learned to see in that moment Jesus triumphing over his enemies. And if we haven't learned to see that, friends, what it means is we're still blind. It's like that story in John of the young man that Jesus healed of blindness. And then he said, what do you see? And the guy said, well, I see people walking around like trees. That's not clear sight. It might be better than full blindness, but it's not full perception. Paul is reminding the, Col- the church in Colossia that on the cross we see Jesus triumphing over the authorities who condemned him and triumphing over the powers of violence and shame and sin and death. Paul says that on the cross Jesus is disarming the weapons of this world, making them powerless in his crucifixion. What we see is Jesus turning swords into plowshares a weapon into a tool of life. Now, what you have to understand is that in its day, the cross and the fear of it oppressed and controlled people across the known world. There were laws people obeyed and injustices people swallowed and a quality of life and suffering that people put up with and a violence that people participated in because if they didn't, They or someone they loved would end up on a cross like that. The cross and the threat of crucifixion was how the Roman authorities, the powers of that day, stayed in power. And Paul is saying when you see the cross, you have to see something different. You must see that the government and the religious authorities and the pain and death and shame and abandonment, all of those things are empty threats now. They have no power over you anymore. Now, Roman generals had a custom. After they conquered a city or a territory, they would find the indigenous leaders They would bring them out. They would strip them of their clothing. They would chain the leaders together, and then they would start a victory parade through the conquered streets of the town in sight of the populace, and in front would be the conquering soldiers in their military regalia with their weapons and their horses and their chariots, and they would be leading the former rulers behind them in chains, humiliated through the streets to show the people, we are in charge now. And Paul is saying in the original Greek, that's exactly what Jesus is doing on the cross. On the cross, Jesus has defeated, disarmed, and humiliated his enemies, all the powers arrayed against them. He is revealing them to us to be powerless because all they could do, all they could do was lie and kill him. And that was not enough. 
to deter him from his mission of forgiving and freeing and reconciling and reclaiming the whole cosmos as the realm of God. In another letter, Paul says, these momentary afflictions that we're going through, this one day that Jesus hung on the cross, it was not enough to stop him. And it certainly was not enough to alter the will of God for salvation and reclamation of the whole cosmos. Paul says, you got to learn to look at the cross and see how temporary and weak and limited every power that stands against us is, and how glorious and eternal are the gifts that we have now in Christ. So I'll ask you again, what are you afraid of? Because most of us live our lives on earth as if the cross has nothing to do with our here and now. The cross is God's promise to us to handle everything after death, but we live on earth like here and now we're on our own. And so we just have to handle our own business and we just have to hustle and we have to cut corners and we have to do things we don't believe in and we have to make compromises to make it through because we're not trying to be martyrs. But the early church, they could see the full revelation of the cross and they weren't trying to die, but they weren't afraid to. And that's how the Church of Jesus Christ grew from 12 nobody failure losers into the largest faith movement in the Roman Empire. Because these Christians who saw the cross became unafraid and undeterred by all the threats and the power of the empire. And they would walk to the Colosseums, to their punishment and death. They would walk in that public parade and they would be singing hymns of joy. And people would walk from this, watch from the sidelines and they would see these people who were condemned and they wouldn't feel pity towards them. They would feel awe. They would feel jealous because they lived every moment of their life afraid of what might happen next. And these people in chains are free. People live their whole lives mentally calculating, how far can I go and what's it going to cost me? And then they would see these believers undeterred, even by the threat of death. And they would say, how are they so unafraid? What would it be like to live without fear? I want that kind of freedom. So I'll ask you again, church, what are you afraid of? How much space does fear take up in your soul? Because in the true church of Jesus Christ, we trust the Lord not just with our deaths, but with our lives. And in a brutal and violent world that tells the lie of scarcity over and over and over again, when we see the cross, we have the courage to live gently and in peace with God and one another. When we see the cross fully, none of the threats of the authority or the powers work against us because we are surrendered to the triumphant goodness of God. When we see the cross fully, we look and we see the worst the world can do. And we also see the beauty and the power of Jesus' resistance. And suddenly, by the grace of God, people who see that are free and unafraid. There's a moral theologian named David Gushy who I like, and he's written a book recently about the Holocaust and specifically about the righteous Gentiles. He said uh, most scholars of the Holocaust will say that there are four categories of people um, who were citizens of the countries, Germany and the other countries that became part of the Third Reich. There are four categories of response. One group of people were perpetrators. They just believed in the cause and they directly participated in the machinery of murder. The second category were collaborators. These people supported the perpetrators. They didn't indirectly do any of the violence, but they directly participated from it. The third and by far the largest category were bystanders. 
These are people who didn't participate, but they did not disrupt. And the smallest group of people were rescuers. They risked their lives. They defied the powers and the authorities to rescue and save. Now, the common wisdom is the way we console ourselves is we say, well, only the rescuers were the real Christians. Everybody else was just pretending. But it's not true. There were many active and sincere, fervent believers in Jesus in all of the categories. So how were so many Christians so easily persuaded to do evil, condone evil, or look away from evil? Because they were afraid. They could not see in the cross a power great enough to free them of their fears. The threats of the authorities controlled them. What they had to lose was too much. There's a woman named Corey Ten Boom who's um, one of the stories of a rescuer. She was a young child. She was part of a Dutch reformed Christian family and her family were one of the few categories of they were rescuers, they were resistors and her family hid dozens of Jewish refugees and one day her father was visited by their pastor and they already had a bunch of people they were hiding in their houses. And the father said to the pastor, hey, we have a young mother and child here. Could you take them? Because there's too many people hidden here. It's danger of discovery. And, and the pastor was, he didn't, he was saying no. And the father asked Corey to bring the infant, just bring the infant into the room. And so she carried this infant into the room. And she said she watched the pastor in the face of a baby and he reached out and he stroked this child's cheek. And then he said, I can't do it. We could lose our lives for this Jewish child. And Corey Ten Boom's father said, I would consider that the greatest honor that could come to my family. And it did. Later on, her whole family was arrested, they were imprisoned, and all but she were executed. But the thing is, that pastor was already imprisoned. Yeah. There you go. What are you afraid of? What authorities and powers and fears are preventing you from living fully in the truth of the gospel? Last week, I met with some pastors who are working on affordable housing issues in our community, and one of the speakers was very knowledgeable and an activist, and he said that our county needs 35,000 units of affordable housing. 35,000 units of affordable housing just so the people who already live here and serve here and make our life beautiful and possible here, just so the people who serve as early childhood educators and nursing home assistants and home health care aides and delivery drivers, just so those folks who we need can live in our community in safety and peace. We need 35,000 more units of affordable housing. And we have all the money, friends. And he said, it's also really important for us all to note that there is a huge disparity in who stands in need of housing. The majority of the people who stand in need of housing are black people or people of coloring. And we need to understand why there is this gap, this disproportionate representation in the need that's greater than their um, proportion in the total population. He says, you need to understand why there is this gap. Where did it come from? And he traces it back to the GI Bill. After World War II, the government made a program for all returning vets, the returning vets who put their lives on the line to resist Hitler and his powers, said, you're going to come back to this country and we're going to give you money for a college education, we're going to give you a mortgage so you can own your own home. It was a ticket to the middle class and generational wealth. And black veterans and people of color were shut out. White veterans got it. Black veterans and veterans of color did not. And the speaker said, imagine, just imagine for a minute how different our community would look if that bold plan for prosperity and welfare had included everyone. So why didn't it happen, church? 
Why, after defeating the greatest threat to the civilized world, after exposing Hitler's plan for racial superiority and ethnic cleansing, why didn't people come back and turn the page? Instead, they came back and cemented the oppression and injustices of the past into the future. Why did it happen? Some people, probably it came from hatred and prejudice. But most people, it was fear. They knew it was wrong, but they didn't want to turn down the advantage. They knew it was wrong, but they feared the price they would pay if they spoke out and said no. Because they did not understand that the cross gives us freedom from sin and death and suffering, and not just in eternity, but here and now. Many of us sincerely believe and live in the hope that the grace of Jesus Christ will set us free in our death, but we are resigned and attached to living in bondage to injustice and sin here and now. We have to learn to see more in the cross. Yes, it is the promise of forgiveness, yes, but it is also the power to resist evil and sin and the fear of death here and now. Here's the thing, Paul says, when your mind is renewed in Christ, then you will see the revelation of the cross that everything you're afraid of, all the powers and authorities that are preventing you from speaking truth and living truth and resisting injustice, all the threats that you face when you commit to righteousness, all the righteousness that your heart desires, none of it is strong enough to stop you when you see that on the Christ Jesus has disarmed the powers and authorities. The cross reveals the truth that all of those things only have the power that we give them. The powers and authorities are powerless. And we don't have to live our lives enslaved to fear. We're free in Christ to resist as Christ resisted. In Christ, we become a people who are unafraid to lose, we are unafraid to be rejected. We are unafraid to be misunderstood for righteousness' sake. We are unafraid to be judged for righteousness' sake. We are unafraid to suffer for righteousness' sake. Because what matters most to us can never be taken from us because we have on the cross discovered the power of laying down our lives. The church of Jesus Christ in this age is weak and anemic because we're willing to be righteous for exactly as much and as long as we think it will work out for us. But there is a cost to following Jesus, and we must be willing to pay it or we're not following at all. If you're willing to stand with Jesus for as long as it means you'll always succeed, as long as it means you'll always win, as long as it means that you'll never look foolish, then you will not stand with Christ when it counts. What we see on the cross is the way of glory, how to resist the authorities and power. What we see on the Christ is cross is Christ victorious over them. And what we see on the cross is that by our willingness to lose and our willingness to suffer and our willingness to fail and our willingness, if needed, if we must, even to die, but never to kill, this is the power of the cross that reveals the weakness of the powers of this world. If you long for the kingdom of God, but you are only willing to win for it, you're never willing to lose for it, then you're going to remain enthralled and imprisoned by the powers of this world and under the authority of the people with power now. But if you will allow the spirit to show you the glory and the power of a willingness to lose and fail and suffer and risk as Christ risks, then you will become free, not only in death, but in life. And beloved ones, we're afraid. I'm afraid. We're weak. I'm weak. Many of us search our hearts and we despair because we know that there are prices we aren't willing to pay and battles we aren't willing to fight and sacrifices we aren't willing to make. We believe and also we have unbelief. We know this about ourselves. And so we stand before the cross condemned. But the good news of the gospel is that that self-condemnation is also nailed to the cross and destroyed in the crucifixion. Amen. 
Beloved ones, we are forgiven and we are freed. And we spend a lot of time living thinking that all we can do is all we can do. But at the cross, Jesus shows us that our limits are not God's limits. In the cross, we can be freed from our fears and empowered to live by grace.